Hello and welcome to my list of the top philosophy papers of 2021. I will be giving a brief description as well as some thoughts on each one, and at the end I'll tell you about the selection process. Here we go. The first paper on our list is Delusional Evidence Responsiveness by Carolina Flores. Unsurprisingly, this paper is about delusions. More specifically, the author is arguing against the common view that delusions, whatever else they might be, are resistant to evidence. In other words, Flores argues that delusions are evidence responsive. For example, people who suffer from delusions will often acknowledge that they don't make sense. They will also try to avoid, respond to, or incorporate contrary evidence into their worldview. However, delusions often remain resistant to evidence in practice. This is because of other factors that limit the capacity of the delusional person to appropriately update their beliefs. These factors include the need to explain strange experiences, motivational effects, and a range of automatic biases that require effort to overcome. All of this helps us to understand delusions as things that can explain behavior and be explained by facts about the people suffering from them. It also helps to reduce the stigma attached to delusions, because it paints people with delusions as reachable, giving us a reason to engage with them as fellow epistemic agents. I like this paper. It was thorough and dealt with a range of objections and implications of the argument. It also cleared up a standing debate in philosophy and remained consistent with current empirical and clinical findings. Great paper all around. The next paper is titled The Semiconducting Principle of Monetary and Environmental Values Exchange, written by Quan Hong Vuong. I must admit the fact that this paper made the list is a bit surprising to me. It's not bad, but it is quite speculative and short, coming in at just five pages. The basic argument is this. Business and the private sector hold the key to environmental protection and renewal, but most efforts to get businesses in line with environmental goals have attempted to appeal to the profit motive. For example, we institute laws that get businesses to pay for carbon credits or to clean up spills. However, the option is always open for businesses to exchange money to free themselves of environmental obligations. So, the author proposes that we count environmental value along with conventional profits to create a new kind of profit. This would incentivize businesses to help the environment because doing so would just be a way to make profit. The semiconducting principle in the title refers to the idea that this exchange of value should only go one way. Businesses should get money or profit from creating environmental value, but they shouldn't be able to spend money to decrease, discount, or ignore environmental value. This paper was interesting, but a little unsatisfying. It was very short, a bit vague, and it wasn't clear if it was advocating for a top-down change in incentives or some kind of bottom-up change in our values or culture, or if it was both, what their relationship would be. In the last installment of this series, Nguyen's paper on echo chambers featured at number one, and he's kept up the good work with two papers on the list for 2021. The first of these is titled The Seductions of Clarity, where clarity refers to the internal feeling associated with understanding something. As Nguyen points out, this feeling can save us cognitive resources, because when we get a sense of clarity about something, we usually take that as a signal to stop gathering information or thinking too hard about it. But this presents a problem. Clarity is a feeling that indicates or is strongly associated with understanding but is not necessarily linked with it. There is a risk that clarity could come apart from actual understanding, and in a way that makes it harder for us to achieve actual understanding because it prompts us to stop thinking or collecting evidence. One way to get a feeling of clarity is to adopt a theory or way of understanding the world that is easy to use, that provides categories and distinctions, allows us to see new connections, come up with explanations, and communicate with others. Nguyen warns that we should be suspicious of systems which have this kind of appealing clarity, especially in domains where confusion and vagueness seem more appropriate. One reason to be suspicious of these kinds of systems is that they can be crafted by malicious agents intent on manipulating us. Another is that seductively clear systems can mask the fact that we should be confused because we're dealing with complex phenomena that are difficult to understand. We should also recognize that vagueness or a lack of clarity often has a value or quality of its own, allowing for a communication that is more open-ended and richer in information. As expected, this was a great paper with a lot of productive insights. It was also quite an easy read. However, I would have benefited from more discussion on the relationship between the appearance of understanding and true understanding. Now at number seven, we have Nguyen's other paper, How Twitter Gamifies Communication. This paper highlights some of the ways that platforms like Twitter can distort how we communicate beyond the more obvious issues with how they surface or filter content. As Nguyen argues, the scoring of tweets through likes, retweets, and follows effectively turns communication on Twitter into a kind of game, which creates incentives to do it in a certain way. 
The problem with this is that our initial values and goals are abandoned in favor of pursuing a small set of metrics that work against moral sensitivity, fairness, and open-mindedness. Related to the previous paper on our list, this change in values isn't forced. Rather, we are invited and seduced by the clarity of metrics that offer something more satisfying than regular communication, because the goals, purposes, and outcomes are made clear. I think an important insight here is the recognition that people can still adopt different attitudes towards this gamification process. We can treat it as a game, plain and simple, adopt the game's values as our own, or ignore the gamification and carry on as normal. While some approaches are arguably better than others, a bigger problem is that all three occupy the platform at the same time, meaning that people are engaging with each other while operating with very different goals and attitudes about what they're actually doing. This is another great paper from a great author and one that I highly recommend. Paper number six on the list is by Andrew M. Bailey and Peter Van Elswick. Bailey himself could have occupied a few spots on this list due to how many of his papers had high download numbers. However, most of them seem to be about the same philosophical topic, so I picked one as a stand-in for all of those. The paper is titled Generic Animalism, and it's about animalism, which is an answer to the question, what are we? Other answers say that we, that is, human persons, are souls or brains or some combination of mind, body, brain, soul, or spirit, or perhaps none of the above. However, the animalist claims that humans are animals. Objections to this view often involve finding some intuitive counterexamples, scenarios involving brain swaps, transplants into cyborg bodies, conjoined twins, and so on. However, as Bailey and Elswick argue in this paper, animalism, as a way of classifying human persons, can be defended as a generic claim. Generic claims are about what is normal, typical, or characteristic of members of a group. So, to say that human persons are just human animals is not to say that humans must be animals in all possible situations. For example, the claim horses have four legs is not refuted by the fact that some horses have three, and as the paper points out, if we understand other animals by making generic classifications, then why not ourselves? If we have independent reasons to consider ourselves as animals, then this seems the right way to understand what makes us what we are. Interestingly, generic claims are both weaker and stronger than universal claims. On the one hand, they allow for exceptions, but on the other, they say something about what is characteristic of a kind. They imply a special connection between the generic properties and the kind which they describe. Overall, this paper gives an interesting and clearly presented argument on a topic that I was not familiar with, so I was glad to find this one and I would like to read more about it. Number five on the list is also by Andrew M. Bailey, although on a different topic and co-authored with Joshua Rasmussen. The paper is called How Valuable Could a Person Be? And in it, the authors try to make sense of the widely held intuitions that humans are both extremely valuable and equally valuable to each other. As Bailey and Rasmussen argue, the best way to account for both of these is to say that humans are infinitely valuable. While being extremely and equally valuable explains a range of ethical intuitions, the implication that we have infinite value comes with some questions. For example, what set of facts could justify something having infinite value? Does it represent an unwarranted or spooky separation from the natural world? Does it support the idea that we are not purely material, since it seems strange that anything finite and material could have infinite value? I would be interested to see how this fits together with Bailey's overall projects and views, given that he seems to support animalism as described in the previous paper. Next up is Rape Culture and Epistemology by Bianca Crew and Jonathan Jenkins Ichikawa. This paper is a subject overview for a larger book, giving a good general discussion of some views and issues on the topic. However, most of the discussion is done in relation to a specific issue, whether or not universities should defer to law enforcement or their own internal processes when handling sexual assault cases on campus. Much of the paper is dedicated to interrogating the assumption that we should defer to law enforcement in such cases. One of the general issues covered in this paper is what we ought to believe, and more specifically, how deference to the evidential standards of courts can inspire inappropriate levels of skepticism and inaction where we have a moral obligation to act. One of the important insights highlighted by the paper is that different situations have different standards for what counts as knowing, and often the decision about which set of standards to apply is made by those in power, who also have an incentive to protect the status quo. This makes the author's view that we should favor one powerful institution over another a little bit strange at first, but I guess the answer is simply that they favor the rules and evidential standards typically adopted by the one and not the other. 
As mentioned, this paper offers a good overview of some pressing questions with a solid back and forth on the points, plus good directions for further reading. At number three, it's Consciousness and the Laws of Physics by illustrious science explainer and one-time Joe Rogan podcast guest, Sean Carroll. Here he takes on views which claim the existence of things not described in our best scientific theories. More specifically, Carroll is targeting views like dualism or panpsychism, which propose consciousness or some mental stuff as a basic part of reality. As Carroll argues, we have good reasons to think that the standard picture of reality given by the physical sciences is enough to explain the brain. Proposing anything extra will alter this picture, especially if that something extra is supposed to play a causal role in the world. Carroll thinks such theories would need to be integrated with existing theories or have enough evidence in their favor to justify taking priority over those theories should they prove incompatible. Carroll doesn't think views like panpsychism can do either. The only way to dodge these implications is to say that consciousness or mental stuff has no causal power itself, which would mean that they have no explanatory power either. I admit that I didn't understand a lot of the paper, being about fairly technical matters in fundamental physics. But I think I got the basic point, and I would say that it's a must-read for anyone interested in this stuff. If you can grapple with even a few of the issues, it would be massively beneficial. The paper also includes a pretty interesting discussion of philosophical zombies. We're going to be treating the last two papers as a set. The first paper by Robin Dembroff is itself a reply to an earlier paper titled Are Women Adult Human Females? That paper was written by Alex Byrne and published in 2020. Dembroff's reply is titled Escaping the Natural Attitude About Gender. Alex Byrne then published a reply to the reply titled Gender Muddle, Reply to Dembroff. Now, since these two papers are dealing with the arguments set out in Byrne's original paper, a paper that I'm not going over here, a lot of the important context is left out. However, here are the basic arguments as I understand them. From what I gather, Alex Byrne's central point is that the concept woman is primarily a biological category rather than a social one. Similar to the way we understand terms like lioness, the standard or correct meaning of the term woman is adult, human, female. In their reply, Dembroff identifies six points in Byrne's overall argument and offers three general criticisms of his approach. First, that he assumes a single unified meaning of woman. Second, that he cherry-picks his examples in question-begging ways. And third, that he doesn't consider other gendered terms that are more clearly social. As Dembroff contends, Byrne is caught in a bind because he uses ordinary language to argue for women as a biological category, while actual biological categories don't match up with ordinary usage very well. For example, biological definitions of adult often conflict with social definitions of adult. In the end, Dembroff also objects to taking the standard usage of words as a reliable guide to metaphysics. As Dembroff argues, something like gender would be too complex and abstract for natural language to map onto in a straightforward way. In his reply, Byrne points out that Dembroff is mistaken about how he justifies many of his premises. As he claims, they are not actually based on ordinary usage, but rather linguistic facts about the meaning of a term. As such, they simply establish the standard meaning of the term woman, and so place the burden on those who advance other definitions to make their case. Byrne is happy to admit non-standard usages of the term woman, but still maintains that only one is standard in a range of relevant situations. Byrne is also not too concerned with claims about adult human female being a vague or messy definition, since we are not similarly troubled by terms like lioness. Other terms like tree or bug also fail to capture the full complexity of biological reality, but we can still apply them in straightforward ways in many cases, and, crucially, their messiness does not imply that they are just social categories. For Byrne, it also doesn't matter that our understanding of biological sex has changed over time. For him, this is just consistent with how our understanding of any complex phenomena changes over time. In this paper, at least, Byrne appears to be somewhat agnostic about many of the general issues around gender, like those about individual gender identity, phenomenology, social construction, and so on. So contrary to Dembroff's objection that you can't do metaphysics through standard definitions, Byrne seems to be avoiding metaphysics altogether and simply making a point about language. This raises some questions. Like, what is the relevance of establishing the standard meaning of a term? Is this practice political or merely linguistic? How do we understand or define ourselves in relation to received meaning, either in opposition to or identification with them? And under what conditions can or should we change the use of terms to best suit our experiences and aspirations? 
I'll leave those to you in the comments. So how did I select these papers and compile this list? Unfortunately, I could not read a wide enough selection of papers by myself to judge and compare directly. And who would trust my selection criteria anyway? Instead, I went with an easily available heuristic, taking the most downloaded papers on fillpapers.org that were published in some form in 2021. Obviously, this is skewed towards papers that are actually available for download, and it also favors papers on topics that have some controversy or popular attention attached to them. Maybe this year we can try something different, so if there's any papers you'd like to recommend, then feel free. But for now, thanks for watching.